I actually found myself increasingly on the outside looking in because I would say, in their minds, stupid things like buy Bitcoin when it was 2018, 2019. You know, to them, I'm a radical, you know, talking about inflation, like shut up and, you know, stick to the narrative, follow the path, you know, stay within the lines. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Kryptonize, another episode, this time with Nick Valdez. He's got a very popular YouTube channel. I thought I had a popular YouTube channel. I'm not even close to these guys. So it's an honor to have Nick on. And we're going to talk about Bitcoin, altcoins, tokenization, and maybe the uh, Baltimore Bridge disaster. We'll see what happens. So before we do, Nick, can you uh, give us a little bit of your background? Yeah, most of you probably know me as DZ. I've been in the crypto space for years. I've been content creation over half a decade. I uh, started out as a professional Magic the Gathering player, as a lot of crypto people actually do, uh, surprisingly. And I eventually just became so obsessed with crypto, I started neglecting my online community for Magic the Gathering. You know, I had a Twitch channel, I was on a team and everything. And while I'm live, to, I like to pretend it's millions of people, but while I'm live to hundreds of people, I would have a, on my second screen, I would have trading, <laughs> I'd have trading view open and I'd be like way over leveraged, gambling with crypto that I shouldn't have been gambling, watching the one minute chart. And I'm like in this, you know, Magic the Gathering's hard. It's like harder than chess. And so like, I'm, I'm like playing the world's best players. I'm like stuck in this match and I'm like watching the one, <laughs> I'm watching trigger waves and RSIs on the right side and Man, when I had an opportunity to go full-time crypto, I just had to take it. Wow, my lord. Okay, so it's harder than chess. I thought Go was the only game harder than chess, but uh, apparently there's another one. Well, Go is similar to a lot of games. We're like almost like playing cards or dice, where you, you just have your set things within the game, your set ecosystem. You know, like even Monopoly, like there's there's Boardwalk, right? You have the most expensive real estate. There's well, with values. Magic the Gathering, they introduce new cards like every three months. Mm. And so then you end up with this database of 20,000 unique items that all do something in a game. And only 0.01% probably are, you know, worth remembering. But that starts to add up as new cards are released every three months. And I would say it's harder to... Well, chess is the hardest game to master. Uh, you know, maybe maybe an argument for Go, too. But ch uh, chess, you know, you have your pieces, and then that's it. You learn what a pawn does. You learn what a knight does. You learn what a rook does. Imagine if chess had a new piece introduced every three months, and it did different things. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of why I would say it's, quote-unquote, harder to learn. Well, did they ever inter introduce NFTs into that game? No, there's other trading card games that do have NFTs. They're based out of Seattle, and they have uh, politics that are, you know, pretty much aligned with that scene. And I actually found myself increasingly on the outside looking in because I would say, in their minds, stupid things like buy Bitcoin when it was 2018, 2019. And so, you know, to me, you know, to them, I'm a radical, you know, talking about inflation, like shut up and you know, stick to the narrative, follow the path, you know, stay within the lines. I, I was never really that guy, and I don't want to call them bootlickers over there, but, you know, they, they didn't mind towing the party line, and they didn't like when uh, there was independent thought within that ecosystem. Yeah, not a good place to be. Uh, nothing against Seattle, because I know not everyone's uh, up there is like that, but... Well, let's call out Chaz. No, no, <laughs> something against Chaz. Chaz, get it together. Uh, you're doing something wrong over there. Yeah. So, but yeah, the rest of Seattle probably great. They probably got great coffee. Yeah. Well, you know, not the best weather, but good coffee. You're right. Okay. So I, I want angry Seattle comments. I want a angry Seattle. So you don't know anything. And Chaz comments. wasn't that bad. It was a social experiment. <laughs> Love it. Love it. All right. Let's move over to Bitcoin since you brought it up. What are you seeing happening? Are we going to see Bitcoin hundred thousand this year, or is it going to go back down after the happening? Uh, to you know, follow the normal 18-month pattern. What do you, you think is going to happen? Ooh, if you would ask me six months ago, I'd say there's no way we're hitting 100K in 2024. All right, that's going to happen in 2025. But then uh, Bitcoin decided to buck the trend and it quit listening to its own playbook. Its old playbook used to say, Bitcoin halving happens, and then eight months later, we'll touch the previous all-time high. Instead of eight months later, after the having, it happened one month before the having, two months before the having, and so now we're eight, nine, ten months ahead of schedule. 
And so I, I certainly think 100K is almost likely at this point. I, you know, I'd be willing to, I'm, I'm willing to give it around 70, 80% odds. Now, you, you probably think, as I do, that most of this is because the ETFs came, you know, were legalized and became live in the last, you know, 60 days or so, right? Or do you have a different opinion? Yeah, but it wasn't even the ETFs. It was the demand, you know, is breaking all these records. Whereas, like, you know, this ETF fund in its first 50 days has never been matched. Or, you know, you're looking at uh, the top 10 ETFs, uh, you know, mostly going to be S&P 500 plays, uh, you know, more than gold, more than silver, more than oil. And all these S&P 500 uh, ETFs are, you know, Bitcoin is hanging out with these big players. And so if you, like, look at February and probably also if you look at March, in the top 10, you got Fidelity and IBIT, the BlackRock uh, Bitcoin ETF, hanging out with the biggest players in the ETF space. Well, you say demand. If the demand was always there, why weren't people buying? Demand wasn't always there, though. And so you got real, uh, you know, Wall Street, you got hedge funds, you got retirement accounts, you got family offices. They pretended like they wanted to buy it. But then when it came down, all right, put your feet to the fire, download Coinbase, and then upload, you know, put in 100K, then start market buying. Oh, too much. Oh, too much friction. about that. But now that you have BlackRock giving you a mechanism and Morgan Stanley and some of these other middlemen, you know, they're providing the access to that. But now if you got a, a brokerage account, it's not that difficult to take profit off gold and roll it into a Bitcoin ETF. It's a lot more difficult to sell, obtain 20K, put that 20K in your bank account, link your Coinbase, take a picture of your license. Don't forget your seed phrase. You lose everything. That, that, no, the, so demand now is just much higher because back then it was, I say back then, four months ago, buying Bitcoin is pretty scary to most people. And I would say it still is actually. Yeah, it, I, I know. And I think it was the friction. I think you nailed it. It's maybe the demand was always there. But once the ETFs became live, it was super easy for these uh, fund managers or, or companies like BlackRock to invest. But you still had Michael Saylor, who I actually felt sorry for when Bitcoin was down around 20,000. Do you remember that? It wasn't that long ago. And this guy's like, I'm doubling down. You know, he's down like $6 billion. And he's like, I'm doubling down on Bitcoin. This guy's got a set of cojones the size of... Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Empire State Building, and it paid off for him. So props to him. But he was like the only one buying. Hey, I'm gold. dressed like Michael Saylor. I, I got the black <laughs> slick satin button up. You know, I'm, I'm in my Michael Saylor gear right now. I'm in my Michael Saylor uh, era minus the billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. Well, you know, props to the team there and the board for not firing him because, you know, he had, he was way down. That was a scary time for him. I, I can only imagine. But he was resolute. He's like, nope, it's going up. And the rest of us were like, well, maybe, maybe in two or three years. But he was like, nope, going up. And it did. So uh, you yeah, got the, the the good side is, you know, he's doing a good job and he's making it less scary for a Fortune 500 CEO to add Bitcoin to the balance sheet. But really, you have Tesla, you have MicroStrategy, then you got crickets. You got nobody. There's there's no one else. And so a lot of people yeah. are like, well, Michael Saylor is going to kick off this domino effect, man. He's the first domino. Whoa, whoa, wait till you see the second domino is probably going to be Google or Apple or Microsoft. It just hasn't happened. In fact, it looked like we kind of had a, a second domino with that South uh, American gold mining company, or they say they're going to buy billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. It ended up being a fraud. The CEO stepped down. And so 48 hours ago, oh, the second domino's here. Fast forward to, to now, oh, never mind. It was all FUD. I fake. almost think the second domino was uh, El Salvador making it their reserve currency. I yeah, I, I would say it. those are two different win. dominoes. Yeah, no, no, they're different. Yeah, one domino, you but got a country got behind yeah, at the it end of right? the, for the first time. A country got behind it. That was huge. Yeah, I would, I would say, I would count that in a separate category. You know, first domino, the final domino that falls is probably Microsoft by market cap. You know, okay, Microsoft, Microsoft is worth trillions. Yeah, and so they have the ability to buy an amount of Bitcoin that's just not, other companies just can't really touch. Apple, there's there's a handful of these tech companies that have so much cash on hand, you know, Maybe. so when that Michael, or micro strategy final domino falls, yeah, you got, you got you know, Satya, you know, saying, yeah, Microsoft, we're, we're all in on the Bitcoin game. The El Salvador domino, to me, that's just a whole different scenario. To me, that's kind of speaking to different things. That's speaking to BRICS, that's speaking to decline of U.S. dominance, hegemony, and that's, you know, that final domino Domino. I mean, that's when you have oil being traded, not in USD, not in a BRICS CBDC. You have oil being traded in Bitcoin. You have, you know, Bitcoin just basically has global adoption. To me, that's, that's going to be a little bit harder to tackle, probably. 
Well, we'll see. We'll see. I, I think uh, Argentina, uh, Argentina is next. You know, any of these new, uh, I don't know if you want to call them dictators, but uh, any of these new leaders that are speaking a different tune uh, and changing their countries, I think it would be smart uh, to, to adopt Bitcoin as a standard. Look what's done in El Salvador. I mean, they're raking it in right now. Yeah, as a rule, I'm against authoritarianism, but seeing what uh, being ruled by committee in Argentina has done and seeing what El Salvador, you know, has done as far as a turnaround with their gang violence, crackdowns, you know, just safety for families, like, call me crazy, but, you know, uh, if your child can play soccer in the yard now and they couldn't two years ago because you're afraid they're either going to get recruited, they're going to get shot, if you got to break a couple eggs to make that omelet, you know... You gotta do it. At the end of the day, you know, I, I think some eggs will get broken, but that happens in our judicial system today. Well, so I'm, I'm not gonna, I, I can't get too upset over a family's ability to live safely in their own home. No, there's no question about that. I think we've overdone it here in the U.S., of course, but in the, uh, uh, not from the police point of view, I think we gotta go back to more of it. But if you look at the history, if you look at Lu Kuan Yu out of Singapore, how he moved a third world country to a first world country in only a generation, he employed some of the same tactics, but he, he had a bigger job. You know, he it was truly a third world country that he moved to first world by deploying a number of tactics. He's what I call a benevolent dictator. It's exactly what they needed. Yeah, like uh, Paul Maudib, like Dune, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah benevolent. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's you know, maybe better than the Atre uh, I love the better Dune than reference. the Arconans, I guess. <laughs> well done. Uh, it's All my right. favorite book. Uh, actually, you read the uh, series, I, I hope. I hope you read the series. Yeah, I got it. Uh, I got the book right here behind me, man. It's my Wonderful. favorite book. Yeah, I just saw the. Uh, yeah, I just saw the second one in IMAX. Oh, I've missed it. I got to go see it. The first one's better. I got to see. It. Oh, the first one's better. Well, yeah, that's typical, except for Star Wars. Okay, uh, let's. Uh, T two, Terminator two. T two. You like T two better? I, it was pretty good. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Cool. I think T two is the last great action flick of the '90s, and it's also the last time you're going to see quality stuntman work. Uh, the things they put those stunt people through is like I, I don't think you would get it cleared by OSHA or the director or any or anybody uh, unless it's an Alex Baldwin movie. Oh, too soon! That was too soon. Too soon. I take, although Tom, sorry, folks. Tom Cruise that was a tragedy. Tom Cruise did his own uh, motorcycle stunt off the uh, cliff four six times. I hear. Did you see that in his last? Yeah, but what they're putting those people through in T two, it's like way harder than anything Tom Cruise is doing. Tom really? Cruise is doing things that's like you know, there's a little bit of danger. A little hey, bit. there's a non-zero chance that this cable breaks off while he's attached to the plane. Sure, that's but on T the two, they're literally throwing stuntmen off moving eighteen wheelers, and you're like, oh, that guy hit the pavement and just started rolling, and his face hit the concrete pretty hard. Uh, and so, like, it's it's a different element. It's like a guaranteed knee sprain versus zero point zero zero one percent chance of death. To me, like, the guaranteed knee sprains are like a little bit crazier. Mm, okay. Well, he know if you remember in Mission Impossible, he went off a, a ramp over a cliff and then parachuted to the ground. That was really him that did that. That was the last Mission Impossible. Yeah. Six times. Yeah. Not just sure. Once. Yeah, and you know what? Again, there's a 0.001% chance <laughs> okay. that parachute doesn't I'll take open. your word for but, it. But, you know, when you got Edward Furlong on a motorcycle, and, you know, he's he's about to get knocked over. You know, that's like almost a coin toss at that's that point. That's true. That's true. But the, the guy's 56. I mean, that's, give him a lot of credit for what he's doing. His own stunts at 56 or 57. Hey, you know, it's his thetan levels are so low. I mean, if your thetan level is that low, there's no telling what, you know, you'd be able to accomplish. Me too, right? There we go. All right, let's get into altcoins. Do you think that uh, the trend with, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, well, we're not seeing XRP, unfortunately, but some of the bigger coins, the top 10, are they going to have any bigger impact on uh, uh, the rest of the altcoin environment? Do you see any changes there? Big impact. So I think the Solana impact is already happening. You know, I, I kind of have some hot 10, takes though, on right? Solana. Isn't, I think isn't Solana top? Yeah, Solana's 10? top ten. Cardano's yeah. flirting with it. Depends yeah. if you have Lido staked Ether or not. Um, but Solana, you know, I was actually doing a deep dive on quality Solana altcoins, and Solana compared to Ethereum when it comes to quality projects with revenue that are trying to change the world or solve a problem, and it's not just DeFi or yield or a meme coin. 
Solana doesn't have too much. It has render. It has like some Jeep. It has some AI plays, and you know, there's Hive Mapper. You know, phone stuff. There's some deep in stuff. You know, communications, compute, storage. But to me, Ethereum, uh, their altcoin ecosystem is just so much stronger. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about uh, what Avalanche is doing. I think the yeah, L2s are sure. really, really poised to you know, benefit off this Dincoon upgrade. So I think Polygon and Base and Avalanche are probably going to be the three biggest winners there. There's a lot yeah, of L2s. Yeah. It depends on your risk tolerance. And I'm very, very biased towards Cardano. I do love Cardano. I think Cardano, you know, they just recently signed a deal with Dubai Police. Cardano has a different mm -hmm. angle that they're taking. They're saying we want less transactions and, you know, less throughput, but we want higher security. Uh, and so I, I think there's a business model that will have a ne necessity for that. Medical records, police evidence that's being uploaded and, you know, some sort of accounting style systems where, you know, hey, if uh, there's any kind of debauchery here with the numbers people go to jail you know so yeah. when you're looking at those type of uh consequences you know hey if you lose this data you know someone loses their medical records and then we're you know in not in compliance and we might have a severe fine from the doj that's when they're going to start looking at uh, other chains and i think cardano could be poised to capitalize off that uh didn't you just have the ceo on your show recently Oh uh, yeah, we have the founder of Cardano and co-founder of Ethereum, uh, Charles Hoskinson on, and yeah, he's uh, he's really focused on Midnight. But I just wanted to ask him about Falconry and uh, secret billionaire bases. But you know, I asked him some come to Cardano questions as well. But I knew what the people wanted to hear. They want to know about his Falcon. They want to know about his bunkers. It did he reveal the secret location? Well, he did. All right, you want to know the secret? He actually revealed that uh, in Hawaii. Mark Zuckerberg. Now, this is what he said. I don't know. I didn't put my eyeballs on it. I didn't talk to the engineer. He said Mark Zuckerberg's secret Hawaiian bunker literally has a submarine port and a submarine base. I mean, that might be next to Ellison's. Ellison's out there, too, from Oracle, right? He's got his own island. Uh, uh, Ellison's got his own island. Yeah, then uh, then when you really hit that next level, like Kim.com, then you just end up like having just giant estates in New Zealand. And then you're like, man, I literally live where the hobbits live. <laughs> I'm really winning at life. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay, let's, let's move over to tokenization. So what's your thoughts on tokenization? And uh, I'm in the tokenization real estate uh, field, full disclosure. But, you, you know, if you, if you listen to Larry Fink and J.P. Morgan and HSBC, they're all talking about the tokenization of bonds and assets and everything under the sun. What, what are your thoughts on, on all this? Oh, I'm very bullish on that. I, I love Chainlink. I think Chainlink could be a pretty good uh, player in this space. And I think there's going to be there's going to be coins with bigger upside. But Chainlink already has, you know, because Chainlink has such a high market cap. But when it comes to risk, I think Chainlink is one of the, the least risky coins in crypto to invest in. I would put it up there with a the Bitcoin. And in a weird way, I think Doge is actually like a semi-safe play when it comes to tokenomics and you know valuation in the next 12, 18 months. But I think Chainlink is going to be a big player. The real estate angle for RWAs, aka real-world assets, is pretty fascinating. I think you kind of see two different realms uh, happening. Three, if depending on how you want to break down the second one. One, you have ownership. It's going to be your property deeds. You know, I, I don't know how much monetization is going to happen with that. Let's just say a, a, a town in California, beachside town, wants to move all property deeds to the blockchain. And then people do the math and they're like, oh my God, I'm looking at all the beach homes. And, you know, there's 2,000 people living in this small town and there's 500 homes and the average price is a million. And so this is a $500 million value coming to this blockchain. Woo! No, you idiots. They're representing the real estate that's worth five hundred million. Your token, all of a sudden, you know, that's kind of like the XRP argument. It's like, oh man, our token, and so they start equating the value of transacting with the value of their bag, and they're like, they think because these real estate deeds are all of a sudden on the blockchain, and they let's just say for a number, you have one percent of the blockchain. You don't all of a sudden gain 1% of everyone's homes valued. You just add it to your bag. But you unfortunately see that moon math in the real world asset. So I would just, I hearken a little bit of caution when it comes to $19 trillion in real world assets are going to be tokenized by derivatives or this, you know, particular sector of the financial world. Sure, that's great. And it is going to pump projects. 
but it doesn't mean your token's valuation is going to be $19 trillion. Well, and in the case of real estate, each of those properties is probably going to have a separate property token anyway. Just because it's on the blockchain, I agree yeah. with you. That doesn't mean that's the value of it. It's when they... They want to do something with it, like either sell it or sell it. Yeah, I actually stopped myself, though. I, I didn't go into the second uh, aspect, two yeah. slash three uh, second aspects. And that's going to be the rental game. I, to me, yeah. that's the exciting thing, the renting. And then, so then you start looking into Airbnb, uh, you know, at, at, you know, even maybe with vehicles, a, a, a Uber-style monetization, uh, value realization, where it's like, okay, now I'm actually, there's revenue involved, there's exchanges uh, of value, and there's ways to capitalize off that value. And so if you have a tokenized project where they have, say, those same 500 beachside homes all across America or all across the globe, and then now you're like, okay, so it's earning money like an Uber, or it's earning money like an Airbnb. Now I see what the token does because there's constant volume, constant activity, and constant revenue. If you tokenize a house and you just have the deed, there's only quote unquote revenue when a house changes hands. Think of how infrequently a house changes hands yep. versus people renting a house like an Airbnb. Yeah, and, that, and that's on the residential side. On the commercial side, of course, uh, things can get really Even better. crazy, really crazy, really fast. So, But Nick, that's all the time we have. We went twice the length of normal that uh, just speaks to you as in really uh, yes you you're very I mean I just scratched the surface a million you, uh, you billionaire are, bunkers you you are uh, very entertaining we could I'm sure we could go on for an hour uh, but we got to cut it short so where can people find you discover is Crypto Mark Zuckerberg messaging you right now is yeah, he saying, saying shut this, guy, this up. guy off yeah we got him off Facebook <laughs> I knew it <laughs> now get him off your channel no so uh, you can find Nick on discover crypto where else can they find you Nick uh, yeah, you can follow my content, DZ underscore BTC. You know, I make some uh, TikTok, some short form content. I'm, I'm pushing uh, X threads as well. And, uh, you know, we also have like a Discord where, I, you know, I give you my altcoin calls. You know, maybe I'm jumping in some of those riskier things. I, I feel hesitant to share on camera. So that's where you're going to find all that. But DZ underscore BTC, or you just go watch our main channel, Discover Crypto. Love it. Thank you so much for being on. Hey, man, appreciate it. Great time. Hi, I'm Mark Fidelman with Smart Blocks. I'm giving you my tip of the week. This is the crypto tip of the week. It's called TetraGuard. You can see it right here. This is the world's first decentralized crypto ETF, which has Bitcoin, PaxG, Ethereum, and this fee token called Quadrant. You want to learn more about it? Go to tetraguard.io. This is a big buy for you right now.